folks. Thanks for uh, making it out this morning. Uh, we are very happy today to have a, a great program together for you. Uh, welcome to the Encore Entrepreneur Forum. Uh, I'm Jennifer Baker. I'm an economic development specialist at the Portland District Office of SBA, and I will be the event MC today. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more from me uh, later on, but first I'd like to introduce the Acting District Director of the Portland District Office of SBA uh, to do some introductory remarks. Well, good morning. Uh, we can do better than that. Good morning. good morning. There we go. We're all awake now. Well, good morning. My name is Rob Ducote, and I'm the Acting Director for the Small Business Administration for the Portland District, which covers Oregon and Southwest Washington. And I want to welcome you to this uh, co-sponsored event between AARP and SBA called Encore Entrepreneurs. This is going to be actually a really exciting opportunity for everyone, not only just for us to participate with you and learn more about what your dreams and your desires are in participating in this event, but also we hope that you'll take away some things that you might want to know about starting your own small business and in pursuing that next career, as it were, uh, from this event. Um, probably should tell you a little bit about the SBA in case you didn't know. Uh, sometimes we're called the best kept secret in helping uh, small businesses start, grow, and succeed, but we started in 1953. Uh, we're a federal agency under the office of the president, and our job is to help businesses start, grow, and succeed. That's it. It's as very simple as it, as it gets. And we believe in that mission passionately, and we dedicate a lot of resources to try to making sure that that happens for small business owners throughout uh, our district and uh, basically throughout the country. Um, to give you a little bit of idea in terms of impact, uh, we talk about capital a lot. Everyone know about everyone here that banks are or are not lending to folks. Well, we actually do pretty well when it comes to, to capital here in the district, and we had a great quarter last quarter. 146 million dollars went to small business owners throughout just the district. Uh, that on top of over 400 million last year. So we care passionately about making sure capital gets out to small business owners. We also care a lot about contracting and contracting opportunities. So, that, so as you begin to think about this next step, one thing you may consider is whether federal procurement opportunities are good for you. And in the district, we do about $1.4 billion each year in federal procurement actions. Billion with a B. So there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of different industry codes to take advantage of that. And then lastly, and one of the most important things about this partnership is the technical assistance and counseling that you'll be able to get your hands on. Often we find that small business owners, regardless of what stage they are in, are concerned that they're kind of alone in figuring out all these things. We ask you to create the business and the great idea and the product and service, and then we basically expect you to also run the back of house. This partnership and the resource partners of the SBA are here to help you understand that piece, whether it's from formulating your business plan, through marketing, through technical assistance and services you may need along your way. So we're pleased to bring those partners to you as well as in this partnership with AARP to say, not only do we want you to start this business opportunity, we want you to pursue that next step, but we're here to help you along the way. So tonight, or today, excuse me, we're going to have a few folks start off the event with you, and then I'm going to introduce the three through our big speakers. First is Joyce Demonin of AARP, Oregon Outreach Director. And Joyce has been absolutely phenomenal to work with, and we really appreciate what she's done. She leads economic security issues for AARP Oregon and is working on health care quality and other safety issues. She directs AARP Oregon's efforts on behalf of workers 50 and over, and is currently the chair of Multnomah County Vital Aging Task Force and Employment Work Group. We also are joined this morning by Calvin Goins, the Regional Administrator for Region 10 of the SBA. He's coming down this morning from Seattle. He's also my boss, so I'm going to say as many good things as I can possibly say at this point. Um, but he's responsible for Alaska, Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. It's a big, it's a, the SBA's largest geographic region, and under his tenure as the Regional Administrator, last year, for example, we did over a billion dollars as a region in capital and over two billion dollars in contracting to small businesses. So thank you, Calvin, for coming down this morning. And we're also joined this morning by uh, Ms. Jennifer Clark, the regional advocate out of the Office of Advocacy. Uh, Jennifer is here, at, and one of her primary missions is to help small business owners, state, local government agencies, federal and state legislators, and trade associations of small businesses figure out this murky thing called regulations and what we can do to help protect small business owners. So Jennifer, thank you for coming as well. Well, that's all I'm going to bore you or entertain you with this morning at this point. So I'm going to turn this over to Joyce. Joyce. Thank 
Hi everybody, it's really great to be here this morning. You're a great looking group and I'm really excited to be here with the Small Business Administration. Uh, I am Joyce Damon, an Outreach Director at AARP Oregon, and we have a small staff of seven located in Clackamas. Um, so we're all over the state, but we do love being here at PCC. They've been a great partner with AARP for a long time. So for a number of years, AARP has been offering workshops called Finding Work at 50 Plus. We've been helping older workers make their job search more strategic. We know it's really hard once you're out of the job market at age 50 to get back in. And, but we also do a lot of other workshops here in Oregon from caregiving to health reform to all kinds of things. And what we're about at AARP is helping people 50 plus create a life of real possibilities. And so we're really happy to be here today to connect you with information and services you may need to start your own business. It's really inspiring to see all of you. But before we get down the road too far, I thought I'd start with a story. I want to tell you about a really unlikely entrepreneur, a woman who has been an inspiration for me and a lot of people at AARP. Several decades ago, there was a retired school teacher, high school principal, the first high school principal, woman high school principal in California. Her name was Ethel Percy Andrus. She retired to take care of her mother who was ailing so she became a caregiver. But she also got active in the retired educator community in California. And as part of that work, she called on some retired teachers. And one day, she was looking for a former colleague, had a hard time finding the address, finally found this place and found a retired teacher literally living in a uh, converted chicken coop. This really got Ethel angry. But she also got organized as a result of this. And so she began to campaign for positive changes for retirees in California. One of the things that made people so poor back then was there was no retiree health insurance. So Ethel got together and she went to 47 different insurance underwriters until she would find someone to underwrite retired educator health insurance. But she did, so 10 years later, um, more and more people wanted the benefits of being working together as retirees. Ethel founded AARP. It's kind of an exciting story because Ethel was 74 when she started AARP in 1958. So can, you can imagine, um, that's a pretty a thrilling achievement for someone who is that age to begin what has become a billion dollar organization. So today we are, AARP is the largest membership organization in America, and we are dedicated to enhancing the quality of life as we age. We champion positive social change and deliver value through advocacy, information, and service. Um, Ethel's motto was to serve, not to be served. So I think that story can ring a bell with this audience. I'm just curious, um, have any of you lost a job in the recession? Raise hands. Yes, you're my people. <laughs> you're the people I think about and care about and worry about. Um, that's, you're the people that really get me excited to go to work every day and to find positive things that we can do to help your life, make, uh, make a difference in your life. So over the last year, the average duration for unemployment for older workers was 53 weeks compared with 19 weeks for a teenager. That's according to the Labor Department um, statistics that were issued a few weeks ago. So we know that some of you who want to start a business after 50 are discouraged job seekers. Maybe that is some of you, maybe that is still some of you. We know that some of you who are looking for a job or wanting to start a business now want to monetize a lifetime of experience. And you'll hear more about monetizing your experience soon. We know that folks who want to start a small business may be someone who has an invention or a project that creates the better widget. And we know some folks who want to start a small business have an idea where they can make money and make the world a better place at the same time. There's an organization actually called Encore Inc. that celebrates folks who do social entrepreneurship with an annual $100,000 purpose prize and we have some of those winners right here in Oregon. And to, to be eligible for that prize, you have to begin your enterprise at age 60 or older. 
Small businesses are the economic powerhouse that create jobs and innovation. We celebrate your courage to venture forth and thank you for your time today. Our hope is that this morning will connect you to tools and resources to help you make your dreams come true, but also to connect you with other entrepreneurs, people in this room, who might have great ideas and resources to share with you. So whether you're 54 or 74, AARP's founder, Ethel Percy Andrus, found it, proved that when you have a great idea, age is just a number. Thank you so much. Well, good morning. My name is Calvin Goings. I'm the Regional Administrator for the U.S. Small Business Administration in Region 10, and it's so good to see all of you this morning. Uh, Joyce, thank you for your kind words. Rob, thank you for your kind introduction a little earlier. And to all of you, thank you very much for being here today. You know, I'm a firm believer that uh, time is money, um, and you have made an investment by uh, being here today. Uh, so you may have an existing business that you've left, uh, or family, or other things that you could be doing this morning to invest in, in this enterprise here today, and we sincerely appreciate you taking time out of your schedules to be here with us. Uh, before I begin, I want to um, uh, give a, a big round of applause, not only to our partners, Joyce and AARP, but our resource partners, and also the SBA staff that are here. If you're an SBA staff member, could you raise your, raise your hand? Let's give them a round of applause for putting on a great event today. You know, our focus at the Small Business Administration is to help small businesses start, grow, and succeed. And I'm optimistic that today you'll learn about some new useful tools as we all work together to improve our economy and put it on a sustained growth to economic recovery. Uh, no surprise to any of you in this room here today about how critically important small businesses are to our economy. In fact, many of you probably know the facts. Today, over half of all working Americans work for a small business. And over 65% of all new net jobs over the past 15 years have been in small business. So as small business goes, as does the overall economy. And small businesses really are the drivers of competitiveness and innovation. And again, they are the keys to the long-term recovery of our economy. So SBA's programs really work arm in arm with Main Street small businesses to grow and create jobs. And frankly, in the process, help improve our communities. You know, it's the small businesses, the Main Street small businesses that sponsor the Little League teams, uh, that are part of the Chamber of Commerce, that are really key to the fabric of our communities, whether it's in Portland, Hillsborough, my hometown of Puyallup, or any other community across the nation. So I wanna talk briefly about those core programs at SBA, as we affectionately call them the three C's, capital, contracts, and counseling. And uh, the presenters that follow and the breakout and the, the discussions that we have as groups will delve into those threes a little, a little bit more, little, those three C's a little bit more in specifics. So this is the, the, the appetizer, if you will, for what comes later. So let's far, start with the first C, and that's capital. You know, SBA works with banks, credit unions, community development corporations, and micro lenders to support the startup, growth, and expansion of small businesses. In fact, during this past fiscal year, SBA nationally supported over $30 billion in lending to small businesses. Here in the Pacific Northwest of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Alaska, we supported over a billion dollars that went to small businesses. Now, since the Recovery Act here in the state of Oregon alone, we've made over $800 million in loans to small businesses. You know, those loans in the worst economy since the 1930s have helped small businesses keep their doors open, keep their shelves stocked, and keep their employees paid. Let me give you a quick example of how a local small business here in Oregon has leveraged those funds to grow and expand their business. Uh, you might have heard of this business, Migration Brewery, with the help of a 7A loan, uh, McKeon Banzar now employs 14 and has seen his revenues increase by over 35% annual annually at, at Migration Brewing. And apparently he's able to produce over a thousand barrels of beer a year with his business. Now I have to tell you, Rob did mention he does work for me. I, I gotta tell you, I'm a, I'm a little disappointed. You know, part of my role as regional administrator is to tour businesses, to see firsthand what they're doing. We have not been to this brewery yet, Rob. Okay, that, all right, good. I just wanna make sure that we, on the next trip we have a chance to visit there. The second C is contracts. 
As you can probably imagine, Uncle Sam buys a lot of stuff each year, from paper clips to Boeing refueling tankers and everything in between. We at the SBA are tasked with ensuring that at least 23% or $100 billion a year of those purchase orders go to small businesses. And this really is an opportunity for the federal government to work with small, nimble, responsive companies, you know, often with a direct line to the CEO, and in exchange those businesses use those federal government contracts to build their revenues and to expand their businesses. Last year nationally, over $88 billion went to small businesses nationwide, and here in the Northwest, over $2 billion. An example, another example of a local company that's worked to actively leverage those federal government contracts is LKA, LKE Corporation, owned by Kim Aram. You know, Kim has been able to double the amount of federal procurement contracts she's received and now employs a team of nine people uh, here in the state of Oregon. And the third C is counseling. You know, I always tell entrepreneurs that if you don't have a counselor, well, let me step back. If you don't have an SBA counselor, unfortunately there's nothing we can do about your marriage, unfortunately. But if you, do, if you don't have an SBA counselor, you should. Because our data shows that when entrepreneurs have a long-standing relationship with an SBA counselor, they're able to grow faster than their competition and it expand into markets quicker than their competition. And we are really lucky to have a great network of resource partners across the U.S. and specifically here in the state of Oregon that can take an idea for a new service or product and launch it or take an existing business to the next level. Nationally, last year, SBA counseled a record one million individual entrepreneurs. And we are so happy about the relationship we have here, and I know we have folks from our Small Business Development Center, our SCORE, and there's also a Women's Business Center and a, business, a Veterans Business Opportunity Center that are standing by and ready to help. Let me give you a final story of how this counseling has helped a local small business uh, really grow and expand. Nathan Sled leads Sled Ventures, a zipline adventure company based in Grants Pass. Nathan received in-depth business strategy and counseling through one of our offices at the community college, and as a result, Nathan now employs a team of nine and has outfitted over 2,000 zipline locations across the U.S. and overseas. You see, entrepreneurs uh, like McKinnon, Kim, and Nathan understand how a solid business plan, aggressive marketing, and tools and resource from resources from SBA can literally transform and grow a business. You know, as a result, over the past 35 months, businesses in the U.S. have created over 6.1 million private sector jobs. In fact, we've added the most private sector jobs since 2005, and American manufacturing is creating the first real new net jobs since the late 1990s. So ladies and gentlemen, think about how much more we can do by working together because of your experiences, your drive, your commitment, and the partnership with AARP, I'm, I'm very excited that uh, next year those numbers will be even brighter. So thank you very much for being here today, and thank you for the relationship that we have with AARP and the SBA moving forward. Thank you very much. It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, uh, Jackie Babicki peterson who is a business advisor from Portland Community College CLIMB Small Business Development Center. Jackie has been an entrepreneur and a teacher and a creative for over 30 years. She currently teaches business skills and entrepreneurship skills for hundreds of small businesses at the Portland Community College CLIMB Center. Uh, Jackie has been a corporate trainer for numerous organizations who wanted to learn how to communicate, work in teams, develop problem, excuse me, problem solving skills, and become more financially successful. Jackie is well known in the Portland area by hundreds of entrepreneurs, particularly those with creative endeavors, excuse me, photographers, artists, graphic designers, fashion designers, potters, and fine and performing artists. Jackie has helped many of them find their focus and become financially independent. So please join me in giving a round of applause to Jackie Babicki peterson She took the cap off my water because being that I'm an encore entrepreneur like you, I was telling him that when I travel, I buy water in the airport and then I have to find somebody who's going to unscrew the cap. <laughs> I don't know about you, but my hands don't work the way they used to be. Um, I really want to thank uh, Jennifer for the kind introduction. and I'm. 
I'm really glad to be here today and talk about Encore entrepreneurship, and even more than that, solopreneurship, um, because that's the path that I have taken, and I have found it works for a lot, a lot of us Encore entrepreneurs. So let's first talk about what happens when you retire. Um, my husband will insist that I've never retired, and um, this is what my retirement looks like. I just want to tell you that. Many of us are what a friend of mine at Kaiser calls healthy Medicare group. And that means we qualify for our retirement income, but we're still full of curiosity and energy, and we want to be active and busy. Some of us feel free to finally do what we've always wanted to do and create our own dream job. Some of us simply do not want to retire, and some of us simply can't afford to retire. And you know as well as I do that average income from Social Security is $1,200 a month. Uh, that's not going to go very far. And often, savings have been eroded by the Great Recession, which also caused a lot of downsizing, particularly for seniors. So I find in my practice at the Small Business Development Center that even though age discrimination is illegal, it is widely practiced. And seniors who want to work but do not have a job have a difficult time even getting an interview. Has that happened to any of you? Um, how too bad. I, uh, what I know is that seniors have a wealth of information and practical lifetime experience and knowledge to share with the businesses where they want to work. They have that in specific industries and areas. You know, they've spent 30 to 35, even 40 years creating that knowledge. And now they're generally not even seen as good employee candidates. Um, there's some notable exceptions. I saw a TV show about a company in Massachusetts and they were talking to the owner of the company who deliberately seeks out and hires seniors. And they were interviewing him and some of his employees, um, some of who are as many as 100 years old. And uh, everyone was happy. The owner of the company was happy, the workers were happy, the um, customers were happy, and you know the products they were delivering were fabulous. I mean, it was just working very, very well. And it seems like that's ideal, but that doesn't happen very often. So what do you do? Well, last year, the Small Business Administration and AARP recognized this problem and realized that for many, entrepreneurship would be the logical answer. In fact, today's event is the result of that memorandum of understanding, and it was finalized last year, and here we are, and look at all of you that I want to talk about this. I think it's great. I'm a serial entrepreneur myself, and I really applaud their perception and recognition for what I see as a great opportunity for many seniors. So my purpose today is to talk with you about what I see, that the current demographic situation is one that is perfect for the discussion of one of the fastest growing models for entrepreneurship, and that is solopreneurship. So what's solopreneurship, you might ask? For a long time, the concept was that a person who was in a solo business was not really in business. The words self-employed and freelancer were often spoken with a sneer. We were really kind of quiet when we said, well, I work from home or I'm a one-person business. You know, like we were apologizing for it. So they were considered less than. But with economic conditions and changes in attitude, and indeed structural changes in the shape of the economy, has made that no longer true. <coughs> Solopreneurship has grown exponentially and indeed has become an accepted and more and more common way of doing business. I actually think that the rise of the solopreneur model began with creatives who, because by the very nature of their work, are not able to create a traditional business. So let's talk for a minute about what I mean by a traditional <coughs> business. We've all seen the picture of that pyramid model, you know, that a traditional business is. And what happens in a traditional business is that the entrepreneur starts their business and for a while, they probably do absolutely everything. They make the product, they do the marketing, they serve the customers, they probably do the books and the banking, maybe even clean the restroom. As they grow sales and acquire customers, what happens is that they run out of time. To solve that problem, what they do then is hire employees. And when they hire employees, the role of the entrepreneur changes. They delegate many tasks to the employees. They often, those are often the tasks of actually do, making the product and dealing with the customers, the front line. And the entrepreneur himself or herself begins to spend most of his or her time managing the employees. They've got to recruit, 
select, hire, train, motivate, and review their employees. And they no longer have time to make the product or serve the customers. They can't personally deliver the product or the service that the business is all about because they're busy managing their business. For many, for many entrepreneurs, this is exactly what they had in mind. And they're very excited. And in fact, if you read the business literature, you'll see that 99.99% .99 of business literature is about building this business. And often if you're a solopreneur and you try to follow that business advice, you're gonna have a hard time. And as a traditional business grows, the transition of the entrepreneur from doer to manager is actually considered the first crisis point in business building. The question is this, will the entrepreneur be able to let go of doing and delegate to others so that the business can grow. The doer has to let go, delegate, and become a manager. Some love this transition, while others, for others, it's a terrible challenge and maybe undoable. Sometimes the business does not survive this first crisis. But the traditional business model does not work for creatives. Think of it. The singer cannot hire other people to sing their songs. The painter cannot hire others to paint their pictures and the designer can't hire others to design their work. So the rise of the solopreneur model has really happened simultaneously with what's being called the rise of the creative class. And the growth of the internet made solopreneurship in other areas both more attractive and more viable as well. So let's look at artists for a moment. What makes them successful as solopreneurs is that they sell their unique talent their own proprietary and unique vision of the world. I call that proprietary vision focus combined with a deep and narrow niche. What the internet has done is allowed solos to be very focused on their own areas of specialty as photographers, writers, and consultants and still reach a very wide audience so that they have a broad client base from which to draw the specific customers who are looking for exactly what the solopreneur produces, no matter where the solo is and no matter where the customer is. And the internet, add the internet to the mix of all of this and the solo business became scalable. Very different from old solo businesses in the past before the internet. The ground has set for the rise of solopreneurship as a financially viable, in fact, very financially successful model of business. We all know what happened next. The Great Recession threw nine million people out of work, many of them seniors. And at the same time, we've seen a rise in entrepreneurship with the formation of new businesses coming from mamapreneurs, immigrants, displaced workers, and now us healthy encore entrepreneurs and baby boomers. All of these are populations that don't fit well into the traditional workforce. We are also seeing at the same time a resurgence of a DIY mentality. It has been a long time since Americans were so interested in making things hands-on so that what they sell is the result of their own hands and their own minds. We call this special knowledge our intellectual property. This is America. When people are out of work and cannot find a job, what do we do? We create our own future. We don't sit home and watch daytime TV waiting for someone to help us out. Instead, we take matters into our own hands. We're a creative, entrepreneurial nation, and we find a way to make money. We form entrepreneurial ventures. We make things and we sell them. We make money where we can. We become entrepreneurs, and more and more often, solopreneurs. As a result, solopreneurship is rising. And what I want to share with you is how the model of solopreneurship is different from the traditional business model. The difference comes that when, from the fact that when a solopreneur grows and becomes successful and they run out of time, they don't hire employees to help make the product because they're the ones that want to make the product with their own hands and deliver the services in their own minds. They can't find people to do that for them. But they definitely need help, and they need others to provide business support, such as webmaster, marketing, office administration, 
bookkeeping, financial management, all those services. But instead, but at the same time, they don't want to give up their creative time to manage and oversee employees. So what they do instead of hiring employees is they outsource to other solos and other businesses. They outsource the tasks that, need, they are, that are needed to support their enterprises. And so what is emerging is a whole new set of business principles for new, in the new business model that works for the solopreneur. The model itself we call the water bug model. Think of a water bug, you know, the body in the middle and all these edges reaching out. Those are the outsourced services. The, bo the body of the bug is you being the business. And I call the solopreneur's model being the business as opposed to the traditional building the business model. Traditional business advice teaches you how to build a business. The water bug model is about finding financial success while being the business. It took me a lot of years to identify the basic principles that make solopreneurship work. In other words, produce financial success. But the solopreneur model can be perfect for entrepreneur entrepreneurs, us. By the way, I consider somebody financially successful in their solopreneurship activity when they can support themselves, put some money in savings, have health care, and have a great middle class life. So why is this perfect for so, so many seniors? Well, here's some reasons. First, many seniors already have the basic requirement, what I call principle number one for successful solopreneurship. They have a lifetime of learning in one particular area. They have focus and often they have a passion about a deep and narrow niche. A focus niche is a primary requirement for financial success as a solo. It means you can't just be a photographer, you must be a photographer of architectural installations or fashion or children. Two critical things happen when you claim your mastery in a focused niche. One is that customers will wait for you because you are the one that they want to work with. And two, you can charge a handsome fee and a handsome price for your work because it's unique. See how that works? Isn't that fabulous? Second, there's a relatively low cost of entry to most solo businesses. The investment capital is usually your intellectual capital, what you already know, and about which you already have expertise. So I call senior solopreneurship monetizing your expertise. Third, the solopreneur's activity's growth depends on how much time you want to spend on it. Say you're 57 and not working. You probably have 20 plus healthy years to earn money. That means you can put a lot of time into making your enterprise work. 20 years from now, when you are 77, you'll probably not have as much energy as you do now. Do you have to stop? Not if you don't want to. Just contract your activity. That means you work with fewer clients. You take fewer projects. Continue your flow of income, but reduce the intensity of your work. And because you do not have a huge overhead to support, expansion and contraction are relatively easy in a solopreneurship business. Fourth, the internet and all the e-tools we now have available and are common in common use, even I'm learning how to do them, have made solopreneur businesses scalable. What that means is ge geography no longer matters. You can sell your product or service anywhere, anytime. Fabulous with the internet. So let me give you some examples. I have an SBDC client who is 67. He got downsized. He's one who needs financial support in retirement. He's looking for a job and getting no interviews. He knows how to apply for a job, but not how to talk about his expertise or how to think about those skills as a saleable product. He's never thought about it that way. So while he's out looking for a job, we're working together so that he can put together a consulting package to sell to his former connections, who no longer want to hire him as an employee, but very much need the expertise and knowledge he carries in his head. He is a senior monetizing his expertise. And then I have another client who is 65. She is a very smart, retired special education teacher who does not have either a pension or a large retirement, and she's putting together an internet-based business to sell her fabulous knowledge about how parents can work with their special needs children. She is building an internet-based business 
where she is offering her books, training manuals, webinars, and DVDs to share what she knows with parents who are desperate for helping me help in managing their troubled children. She is a senior, monetizing her expertise. I have many such stories. The baby boomer generation is starting to turn 65 and leave the workforce, some willingly and gladly, some not so much. We are taking with us a tremendous amount of knowledge, wisdom, and expertise. Since the aging of the baby boomers will continue at a rapid pace for another 17 years, we as a nation are facing a huge brain drain. But you know that doesn't have to be. We as we can consult, we can write, coach, teach, and teach those behind us what we know and make a good living doing so. We can also blog, photograph, lecture, invest, invent, instruct, and we can start small businesses, some as solopreneur businesses, and monetize our expertise, make money by selling what we know. At the Oregon XB SBDC, Small Business Development Centers, we are building the capacity of our advisors to work with this population and help them identify their areas of expertise, look at their alternatives, and learn the skills needed to start and grow a business and help them take the next steps to financial well-being and a prosperous encore entrepreneurship. Contact your SBA, Small Business Administration, or your SBDC, Small Business Development Center. There's 1,100 of us throughout the country and 17 in Oregon. And there are just many ways we can help you achieve the financial success you are seeking and along the way create the dream job you have always wanted. I think now is our time. Thank you. Our skill is in our mentors' knowledge. They are vetted, experienced um, professionals, usually retired. Some are not. Some are doing it just for more stimulation. They're carefully uh, brought through a program that qualifies them so that we don't get people who are not qualified to provide them services. We have to listen carefully, 
suspend judgment, be able to characterize what you're hearing back in the feedback loop to establish the relationship with your client. And lastly, um, it's the skill set. And I'll turn that over to Mary. Okay. Just FYI, originally SCORE stood for Service Corps of Retired Executives. We often are asked, what does SCORE mean? That's where it comes from. We have a few people who are not retired who are willing to volunteer, but most of us are. Um, I, in my past, have worked for the American Red Cross in the Southwest region. I owned my own consulting business in training and employee development. I have been a solo entrepreneur, and most recently I'm retired from Intel out in Hillsboro. My specialty is human resources and personnel work. So we have over 50 counselors with various specialties who volunteer for SCORE. And when you ask for help, if you have specific needs, we get you in touch with that kind of counselor. I get quite a few questions, this relates to our previous speaker, about the difference between an employee and an independent contractor. And in that water bug model, you know, you're going to be dealing with independent contractors. You may consider yourself an independent contractor. There are fairly complex IRS regulations about that. So I tend to get those kinds of questions because I have a background in personnel work. The kinds of people we see run the entire gamut, like Larry said, between walk-ins. We take walk-ins in our office downtown, second and Alder in the ODS Tower during weekdays. I volunteer Wednesdays, so I see people who walk in on Wednesday. And it's everything from a young person in his 20s who wants to start a bicycle repair shop all the way up to somebody uh, similar to, to what was described by Jackie, our speaker, who has experience and is a little bit older and now wants to leverage that into a business. If, if, you, if you're past that startup stage that Larry mentioned, we also have a business advisory team that we can send out to establish businesses who are struggling with complex questions of growth or finances or whatever. So we're there to serve you. We are in the same office as the SBA. We receive some funding from the federal government through the SBA to allow us to maintain the office um, and take walk-ins. Not all SCORE chapters have the luxury of an office space. Many meet in Starbucks or in the business home or just some other place, but we do have the luxury in downtown Portland of having an office where we can see you if that's best. Let me add one more. And we do outreach. We have uh, access in Hillsboro and Tualatin. We're working on a relationship with a lot with Merrill Lakes College. Uh, they've got a college over in Northeast Portland. So we try to go where the client is because your time is the most valuable. Instead of commuting Portland and back, you can save several hours there. You can also save time for the, the, the counselor to go out. Resident somewhere close to where we're operating from. The other is our services are free. We can characterize the problem, we'll align the best counselor available to the problems that you describe, and we start the relationship there. And if you look at the second or third time that we meet, we really uh, evolve the problem set and it's much more specific to where the client is. And we're aiming at a mentoring relationship over the long term. It's not a one shot deal. We want to be your partner as you go through the process. We do offer a number of workshops, which you can, you can uh, Google SCORE PDX and see what's going on or call the office. You do not need to register for a workshop or be in an educational program in order to get free counseling and mentoring from SCORE. So we have a lot of people that just walk in and say, I'm struggling with my business plan or I don't think these financials will work for me, what do you think? So, um, that, like Larry said, it's, it's, a, it's a very well-kept secret. We do counsel over 2,000 people a year here in the Portland, uh, through the Portland chapter at the various locations. And we have about 70 active counselors right now. Hey. Also, if you'd like to counsel, see us. <laughs> if you'd like to work for free, we're available. 
Uh, thank you so much for that introduction to SCORE. Uh, now I'd like to invite Joyce to share a little bit about some of the, the ways you can learn about what's going on at AARP uh, through their media and web media outlets. Uh, well, as I mentioned, AARP, we're really concerned about retirement security and financial security for our members, which are 50 and older. And uh, we did enter this alliance with the Small Business Administration uh, about a year ago in May 2012. And our goal is to reach 100,000 Americans nationwide with um, programs like this. So because we're really a small staff here in Oregon, we're really lucky to partner with the Small Business Administration and the great team that they have uh, with their own employees and also the volunteers like this SCORE. Um, Portland Community College, the Crime Center, etc. So, but at AARP, we do have some tools that might be helpful to you, and these are more online tools. And I think one of the things that's great about the on online presence is that, you know, if you're a creative person, you're an entrepreneur, you're probably thinking about your business. It's running in the back of your mind 24/7, and then you know, two o'clock in the morning, you may have, ah, I need to think about something, and you can go. You know, there's going to be a lot of that goes on in your work. Um, um, I've been entrepreneurial in my life. I, right now I'm not doing a business, but I have in the past, and I know how that goes. Uh, so anyway, we have um, a great website at AARP that is www.aarp.org forward slash start a business. Start a business is one word. And I put that, there's a handout uh, that you could pick out, uh, pick up over there. And this uh, Start a Business page has a whole bunch of resources for you on, that you may need. And I know for some of you, you may be in a really beginning stage where you think, well, I really want to do something. I don't really know what to do to get started. Some of you may be running a business right now and you need to go to the next level or maybe you're not making enough profit out of your business, whatever it is, There's, there are resources to help you online. Um, the other thing we have that I think might be most interesting, the, the, the handout I gave you guys is all of our work, financial security, start a business stuff um, that relates to uh, the workforce in general, whether you're your own employer, running a business, or you're looking for a job, or maybe, you know, in today's world, we do a little of all. I mean, you may be um, underemployed, maybe you're a, a contractor with one organization, but it's not enough to be the full-time job, so you're combining, you're mixing and matching, you're doing some freelance work or solopreneur work in one level, and you're working part-time for an organization. So, you know, in, t in today's world, we're living in a different environment where we're always reinventing ourselves. And so if you would feel like you are reinventing yourself, you are not alone. We are all in the same boat with you. In fact, some people say, you know, the world we're living in is that it's more of a project management model where we're doing something and it's like, let's pretend we're all, you know, movie stars. Well, we, we, you know, we're, we have a role, we do the role, and the movie's over, and then we go off and do something else. But work is sort of turning into this in some degree. So we at AARP are trying to give you resources that you can access when it's convenient for you. Um, so with that, I think, uh, you know, we're online. Oh, but the other thing I wanted to point out to you is another website we have that might be interesting. Um, Hope you're all on LinkedIn. Everybody on LinkedIn? Everybody should be on LinkedIn. Uh, that's one of the things I think we tell people who maybe have done traditional work for a long time and they're moving either into looking for a job or doing something with their business is to develop that social media presence. It's really important for people to check you out. Um, anyway, on LinkedIn, AARP now has a relationship with LinkedIn and we have a group called Work Reimagined. It's a group on LinkedIn, workreimagined.org, and you can join this, and it's a discussion platform, and it relates to, but is not exclusively about work in all of its facets. So it could be the age discrimination issue that Jackie brought up, it could be um, this idea of episodic work, it could be solopreneurship, or all of the above, and you can start a discussion and find other people who are really interested. Some of the, on, the online platforms AERP has dealt with in the past, this is one of our fastest growing, people really like it. And what makes it useful is that whole idea of the crowd.
crowdsourcing, where the more people engage in it, the more uh, powerful it becomes. So you all are the experts and you're sharing with each other. So that's where we are right now and we're just glad to be here. Thank you. much for the introduction. This is probably just a good occasion uh, to share with folks that a lot of what the panel is, is telling you about now is encapsulated in handouts in your packet. So please, when you go home, don't put this packet in the kitchen drawer and file it away. Know that all of the links that are being discussed, uh, the handouts, the flyers, the literature you picked up uh, as you came in is, is all written down somewhere. Your pins don't have to go too crazy at the moment. We have that reference information captured for you. Uh, also, we know that in a, you know, a 25 to 30 minute panel, you, you can't capture all of the information or ask all of the questions that may be coming forth. So really our intention is just to give you an introduction to the wealth of resources that are out there, uh, a majority of which are free. Uh, as long as you, you go online and schedule, you can make an appointment with the store, you can make an appointment with the Small Business Development Center. And depending on the level of engagement you see, uh, there are workshops, there are seminars, and there are full-on class curriculum that you can subscribe to. So, uh, so that's all very exciting. And I personally had no idea until I started working at SBA how much there is to support entrepreneurs. So hopefully you get a little taste of that today. Uh, also on the panel is my colleague, Scott Awesome. Scott has worked in the lending industry for over 17 years and uh, would love to ask Scott to share a little bit with us about how entrepreneurs can establish themselves as eligible borrowers, uh, what recommendations he has for folks looking to apply for business capital, uh, and maybe what characteristics of Encore entrepreneurs uh, make them particularly credit worthy borrowers. Sure, sure. Um. So everybody has like four hours, right, from here forward to talk about that. Um, as Jen said, though, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you a very, you know, a 10,000 foot, but a 100,000 foot level here, but uh, certainly willing and would love to talk individually, you know, afterwards and whatnot. So with that, the, the first question, they're eligible borrowers. That is, I think, the key to that. And, and what makes an eligible borrower? I get that question a lot. And the reality is that is a You've got different lenders, you've got micro lenders, you've got traditional banks, you've got community development institutions. What might be eligible for one of those, uh, and, and certainly acceptable and a good deal to them, might not be very attractive to another lender. And so you have those differences. Um, eligible borrower is gonna mean something different for the different types of lenders that are out there. You also have every business is a little unique. I say there's something wrong with every small business request. And so as a lender, it, you know, they're, they're going to have risk. Their lending involves risk. And, and what they're trying to do is establish a comfort level with that risk and mitigate those concerns that they have. And so every deal is a little different. Um, everything is case by case. One business might need $5,000 to start, and you're going to approach probably a micro lender. The other, you know, another business might need 150,000, um, and you're going to be looking at more traditional financing, probably. And that's a lot of what I do day to day in working with borrowers is getting them pointed in the right direction. Lending is can be like a black hole to people when they're starting to look at that. Where do I go? Who do I talk to? So that's that's a lot of what I'm I'm helping people with day to day. And what I can say is one of the the, the key things that's kind of consistent throughout these is to really understand your personal credit, especially as a startup. Um, that, that's one of the key things you can do if you're preparing to look at asking for money or looking at a business um, and the feasibility of it, is to understand your personal credit. Some of you out there may be very on top of that, you know what your score is, um, you know if there's any issues there. Others maybe not so much. And so the, the thing you wanna do is really understand your credit and be prepared answer questions about that because as a startup, one of the primary things that a lender is going to look at, whether again it's a micro
micro lender or a traditional bank is what is your personal credit? They have nothing, you know, as a startup to look to historically. You have the experience and the, you know, what you're going to bring forth to the business plan. But as a lender, they have no sales history. They have no, you know, cash flow history for what you're trying to start. So one of the main things they're looking at is that personal credit. So understanding that everybody's had issues. We've come off a really tough few years. It's, it's, it's actually uncommon to find people that don't have issues. So there's always, you know, there's a story there. It's not as if lenders are going to turn, you know, shut their door if you've had a couple 30 days late. And so it's, it's navigating what are those issues, being up front with them as you're approaching lenders. You know, you don't want to sit down with a lender, have them ask you, well, how's your personal credit look? And you say, I think it's okay. And then they pull it and it's, and there are some issues there. That's, it's going to turn them off right up front, certainly. So as you're, and I'm going to echo some of what we've already talked about, but as you're exploring that, you know, I think the key is to really reach out to these resources, sit down with an SBDC counselor, sit down with a SCORE counselor, really develop the feasibility. A lot of people have great ideas, but when they sit down and they actually go through, how much am I going to need to start this business? Can I really make it work? You know, you might run into some, some issues where, okay, I've got to refocus and maybe I need to raise some additional money to bring to the table for this business. So it's, it's exploring that feasibility, creating reasonable, not just projections, but reasonable projections that you can rely on and feel comfortable that if you start this, if you invest that, that money or you invest that time, take a loan out, you're going to be able to repay that. And so that's, again, 100,000 foot level. I love talking with individuals, potential borrowers, existing business borrowers. So I'd be happy to do that afterwards. Great. Well, thanks so much, Scott. Unfortunately, we didn't program in question and answer time period because the last segment of the program, we're going to invite all of the panelists to circulate around and there's a worksheet kind of exercise. And so you'll have the opportunity to mingle a little bit during the last session. So please join me in giving a round of applause.